Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to show you how you can calculate the weighted average cost of capital or WAC for a firm that is undergoing a change in capital structure. So here is a numerical example to illustrate this point. So suppose a firm currently has a debt ratio of 40% and the firm is considering expanding its current operations and looking to fund the investment using equity and debt such that after the investment is undertaken the debt ratio will increase to 50 percent now furthermore you're told that the cost of debt is five percent the risk-free rate is four percent the firm's current beta is 1.2 so this is important whenever we refer to the firm's beta we are referring to its equity beta and the symbol that I'm going to use for that is beta s which is beta of the stock so we're saying beta s is right now 1.2 you're given some additional information the expected market risk premium is given as 8% the corporate tax rate is given as 21% the first thing that is being asked is what is the firm's current weighted average cost of capital the second perhaps more important question is how does the WAC change or what will be the firm's WAC after the change in capital structure so here is a very quick way in which you can try and visualize the problem you have a firm which has some debt you have a firm which has some equity already and you have a firm which has used those debt and equity to fund some assets now I'm trying to depict this balance sheet in market value terms. So let's use the symbol B, which is short for bonds to denote the market value of this debt and use the symbol S to denote the market value of equity. And let's use the symbol V, which is short for value to denote the value of all these assets. The balance sheet, of course, always balances, which means that V has to be equal to B plus S. In other words, the value of all the assets is equal to the sum of the market value of debt and the market value of equity. On top of that, we are saying that currently this B or the market value of debt is such that B over V which is the same thing as B over B plus S. This is essentially right now equal to 40%. What the firm is planning on doing is that it's planning to invest in additional assets. So it's planning on increasing these assets. How are these assets going to be funded using additional debt and maybe some additional equity? But presumably debt is gonna be more than equity so that after the investment, the market value of debt as a fraction of the expected sum of debt and equity, this is going to be 50%. So the firm's target debt ratio is 50%. Now the first task at hand is to calculate the weighted average cost of capital that prevails today or currently. Weighted average cost of capital is exactly as the name suggests, is a weighted average of the cost of debt, which I'm denoting by the expected return on debt, and the cost of equity, which is expected return on equity, the one thing that we have to be careful of is that the cost of debt that we consider is the after-tax cost of debt. And the reason is that interest expense is tax deductible. And so that's why I'm multiplying the expected cost of debt with 1 minus T here. Weights in this weighted average are denoted by B over B plus S, which is the percentage of debt, and S over B plus S, which is the percentage of equity. By definition, S over B plus S is equal to 1 minus B over b plus s right because if this is 40 percent then this has to be one minus that which is 60 percent so this calculation is rather easy debt right now is 40 percent so 0 0.40 the expected return on debt which is the cost of debt that is given which is five percent the tax rate is given to us in this problem that's 21 percent so one minus 0 0.21 and then if debt is 40%, equity is going to be the remainder 60%, so one minus the 0 0.40. Now the cost of equity, that is not given to us directly. However, we do know that the expected return on equity can be calculated using something called the capital asset pricing model, which basically says that the rate of return that equity holders require on their equity can be calculated as the risk-free rate plus the equity beta times the expected market risk premium. And if you look at the question, all these different data are given to us. We are told that the risk-free rate is 4%. We are told that at least currently, the equity beta 
is 1.2 and we are told that the expected market risk premium is 8% and you can use all of these data to figure out the expected return on equity. In fact, if you do this math, that will give you 13.6%. So that is the number that you will plug here, 13.6%. And now you have all the pieces of information to calculate the firm's weighted average cost of capital currently. And so if you do this math, you will get 9.74%. Now the next question is, how does the weighted average cost of capital change after the change in capital structure? What that's really saying is that what happens when debt becomes 50%? So now debt is going to become 50% of the capital structure. Of course, if debt is going to become 50%, equity also is going to become 50%, which is 1 minus 0.5. So that part is simple. The cost of debt is given to us, that is 5%. And uh, 1 minus tax rate is still going to be 1 minus 0 0.21. So you might say, well, this is rather simple, right? Because all I got to do is just change the weights in this equation and the expected return on equity. I just calculated that, that is 13.6%. And so I'm done. If that sounds too good to be true, that's because it is. And the reason for that is that you cannot use the expected return on equity to be 13.6% anymore. Because when a firm becomes more indebted, equity holders risk increases. And when risk goes up, equity beta has to go up as well. This 13.6% that we calculated assumed that the equity beta was 1.2, which it was when debt ratio was 40%. When indebtedness is going to increase to 50%, equity beta is going to go up. And as a result, the rate of return that equity holders are going to require, that is going to go up. So it's going to be more than 13.6%. Now, a natural question then to ask is how much will equity beta go up by? And as a result, how much the cost of equity will be? It turns out that there is a relationship between a firm's asset beta and a firm's equity beta. A firm's asset beta, which is the beta that would exist if the firm had no leverage or had no debt, this is equal to S over B plus S times equity beta. Now, some of you may have seen another variant of this. Some of you may have known asset beta as unlevered beta. And so you may have seen unlevered beta equal to S over B plus S into levered beta. They mean the same thing. The reason why this formula is useful is because it can help us figure out what the firm's underlying asset beta or unlevered beta is based on current capital structure. And then based on that, we can figure out how the firm's equity beta is going to get affected with a change in capital structure. Okay, I know that's a mouthful, but here's what I mean. Let's take a look at what is true currently. We know that the firm's current debt ratio is 40%. So what is the firm's current equity ratio? Yep, you got it. That's 60%, so 0 0.60. And we also know that the firm's current equity beta is what? Well, that's 1.2. Can we use these two to figure out what is the firm's underlying asset beta? Of course, we can use these two numbers to say that the firm's asset beta is 0.6 times 1.2, which if you do the math will give you 0 0.72. Now here's the beautiful thing about acid beta. Acid beta is a constant number in the sense that as the firm becomes more or less indebted, this number does not change. Why? Because by definition, this is the beta that exists in the absence of any leverage. And so once you have figured out the firm's underlying acid beta, you can actually rewrite this equation to say that for this particular firm, it's always going to be true that 0.72, which is a constant, is equal to S over B plus S times equity beta. This equation is going to hold for any equity ratio or any capital structure. 0.72 doesn't change, but if the capital structure changes, 
then any impact of that is going to be on the equity beta, not the asset beta by definition. It is precisely why equity beta is referred to as levered beta because changes in capital structure or changes in leverage impact this number, not this number. Why is that important? Because now if you know that the firm is undergoing a change in capital structure so that this 0.6 is now becoming this 0.5 or 50%, then this number right here is going to become 0.5. So you're essentially saying 0.72 equals 0.5 times equity beta. And of course, you can use this to figure out that equity beta equals 0.72 divided by 0.5, which if you do the math, gives you an equity beta of 1.44. Notice that this number is higher than 1.2, which is the beta that was existing when the firm had 40% debt. This shouldn't surprise you. This is consistent with what we said earlier. As debt goes up, equity becomes riskier. And as a result, the riskiness of equity vis-a-vis -vis equity beta that goes up. Once we have this pinned down, the rest is easy because the rate of return that equity holders want is a function of the risk-free rate, the equity beta, the market risk premium. We now have all those numbers. Specifically, you can calculate the expected return on equity as the risk-free rate, of it, which is 4%, plus the new equity beta that is going to prevail, which is 1.44 and you multiply that by 8%. And that is the number that is going to go here instead, 15.52%. So the rest of the math is easy. You now just need to calculate WAC. And if you do the math, you will find that this new WAC will be equal to about 9.735%. The key to this calculation is these two steps right here. The first step involves you taking the firm's current capital structure, and current equity beta to figure out the underlying asset beta. This was the first step we did. This step is known as unlevering the beta because that's kind of what you're doing. You're taking away the effect of leverage and saying, you know what? The current beta is 1.2. It is at that level partly because the firm currently has 40% debt. What if I strip away the effect of debt? What will be the beta that will be left behind? That is exactly what these steps are doing. And you're saying that, well, the beta that will be left behind will just be 0.72. Once you've figured out the underlying asset beta or unlevered beta, you then use that to say, okay, now if leverage goes up to a certain level, say 50%, then what will be the resulting impact on the equity beta or the levered beta? And this step is called re-levering the beta because, well, that's kind of what you're doing. You're levering your unlevered beta up given a target capital structure. Now, before we get done, there is one thing that I want you to be mindful of, and that is this. When we use this formula, this relationship between asset beta and equity beta, or this relationship between unlevered beta and levered beta, this formula assumes that debt is risk-free. That is a fancy way of saying that this formula assumes that the cost of debt is equal to the risk-free rate, which, as you can see, is not true in this problem. The cost of debt is 5% and the risk-free rate was given as 4%. They are kind of different. Now, this difference is not that large, so debt is not very risky. So this formula is okay to use without too much error in our calculations. Nonetheless, this is something that you should be mindful of because if you try to do these calculations for a firm whose cost of debt is way different from the underlying risk-free rate, then you wouldn't be able to use this formula exactly. But don't worry, in most cases, especially for firms which are cash rich and whose debt is not that risky, these formulas are more or less reasonable to use. And even when debt is very risky, it turns out that we can augment this formula but that's for a separate video. If you found this video useful, click the like button and subscribe to the channel. And feel free to ask any questions using the comment section. Happy learning.